Welcome everyone to our weekly roundtable with your three Brattleboro state representatives. I'm Emily Kornheiser and we have Representative Molly Burke and Representative Justin Salino here, as well as a number of lovely family members. Um, and they're not our family members, they're our constituents and community members. And before we went on air, I mentioned that your three Brattleboro state representatives are a little tired this morning because we wrapped up um, this piece of the session yesterday, and we are now in recess until August 25th. Um, and so had a very full day and a very full week and are excited to tell you about all of that, but also seek your forgiveness for whatever words come out sideways because <laughs> it's been a really long week and this is just first thing in the morning. So happy to see you all. Um, we are going to really focus today's session on how we um, appropriated the federal COVID relief funds and really run through that um, and focus conversations about legislation, um, non-financial legislation um, for other conversations and meetings in the future. And now I'm going to cede the floor to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, Molly, I'll, you I'll, yeah, I'll go. Um, I, I think you know, just looking over what we did the past few days, and and putting taking all this money that we have from the federal government, and and uh, putting it in places where we really want to help. And it's just ironic that that this virus has allowed us to like do a ton of things that we would have liked to do in any year and, you know, give special money to, to different, you know, worthy, worthy organizations and causes. So it's like, you know, the, the other, the silver lining side of the, of the virus is this. And we did like a ton of stuff. I, it's hard to even begin. I, I'm just going to start with actually what we did in transportation because uh, it, it some of the, wasn't necessarily, um, CRF funding, but we did um, put the, 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 because of the virus and because of the um, social distancing, the, we have made public transit all over the state fare free. And that has come from the CARES money, the very early money that came from the federal government. So they've been operating fare free and they've also been using that money to do things like set up, they've even set up like shower curtains around the drivers and and made it, you know, and they're, they're, but their ridership is down like 50%. And, but they've had to do all this cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. So that money has gone to that. But in addition, in the, the T-bill, H942, we put in an extra um, $500,000. And that was actually in before the virus hit. And that was to develop new routes and to better connectivity with rural, rural transit. And that came out of a study that we had commissioned the year before. And then the Senate put in a couple of really exciting things having to do with um, $500,000 uh, micro transit uh, grant program. And this micro, um, micro transit and um, demand response uh, transit program, which really sort of dovetails with what the, the sort of climate that we're in right now, that people don't want to get on a bus with a lot of people. But this is sort of like an Uber type of program where you would you would call the bus and, you know, I'm, I'm here at this address and I need to go to the hospital or I need to go there or there. And they're already have applied, they're, they're doing that in Montpelier. There's a, a pending grant for that in Montpelier. But this would allow um, a municipality or even an energy committee, a town energy committee, I don't know, Michael, if you're still, um, to apply for a grant to do a micro transit pilot project. And the grants would be up to $100,000. So there's just $500,000 in that fund. But I just wanted to talk about that because it, it wasn't like part of the money that we were allocating this week, but it's, it's related to, to the, the virus. Uh, and then I just have so many notes on so many, so many things that we did. I'll just hey, start with a couple of them and then my colleagues can jump in. Some of the, um, the sort of things that people might be interested in is that we were 
able to put in, what did it wind up be, $28 million for hazard pay for um, uh, certain public safety, public health, health care, and human service employers to provide hazard pay to their frontline workers. They had to do it through the, through the employer. So that was something I know I had constituents who were concerned about that. And um, a couple of other things, $12 million to the to provide, um, continue to deliver summer meals to children to continue the program that they've been doing all year. That was through the um, uh, Hunger Free Vermont. And I think it was 4.7 to the Vermont Food Bank. And um, just a lot of different uh, things that we were able to put into that particular bill having to do with health care and human services. And then there were other bills to do with broadband, housing, and a bunch of other things that I'll, I'll let um, somebody else talk about and I can circle back on other things. So just to get that conversation going. Thanks. Before we um, jump to Tristan, I just want to set the stage for a second in a way that I hadn't before. Um, I, for the COVID relief money, it was around a billion dollars, and there were a number of restrictions on the funding that came out sort of later in our conversations with the federal government and our legislative council um, that I think are important for folks to understand. And so one of them, which um, is really important, is that all of the money has to be spent by December 30th, which is very, very soon. And so that means that we need to make sure that we are spending the money places that it can be spent quickly and that it is not sort of creating a future financial obligation that we won't be able to meet. So that's one restriction that becomes quite complicated quite quickly. Um, another one is that it has to be very closely tied to COVID relief, um, which sometimes can take some, you know, finessing, um, but we really, if we cannot um, pass the straight face test on that, that means that we run the risk of the federal government take, trying to take that money back and us not having the money to give back to them. Um, so those are the two really um, important pieces for folks to understand that informed how we made our choices about where that money would go in addition to sort of community need, um, immediate community need, and what we anticipate as future community need. Thank you, Emily. And then I was going to add something similar to that, so I really appreciate that framing. The other thing I would say is that the ability to use, Molly sort of said some interesting things about things that we might have wanted to do that we couldn't do, and, and the, the, our ability to do that varied from sector to sector. So I think in transportation, that, that's probably more true than it is in some parts of where we put money. and, and and yet there are still some places that um, the, the dual mission of COVID relief and some sort of transformative investment uh, was possible in other places where we were simply trying to use that money to backfill uh, financial needs that uh, various parts of our economy needed in order to, or need in order to survive. Um, and so uh, I spent um, my committee time over the last, several weeks in the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee was pretty focused on business recovery, nonprofit recovery packages. Um, and we made a few investments that are, um, go a step beyond the um, simple recovery. And, and I'll, I'll just name those uh, as examples. Um, we, uh, um, we directed a little bit uh, of the COVID relief dollars to um, programs to support women and minority owned businesses that um, at a level that, that we've never done before. Um, and I'll just say for, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but one of the ways that structural racism shows up and sex, structural uh, sexism shows up is that um, women and minority owned businesses have a substantially more difficult time getting access to uh, loans and other investment opportunities. Um, you know, it is, if, you know, if you're a white male business owner, I think you're two times more likely than a woman to be able to get funding and you're more, three times or more uh, to an African American um, and 
So there are slices within that, but it's a substantial difference. And this is uh, the first time that I've seen where we've done a, a sort of much better job of explicitly recognizing the extra hurdles that it takes to have a minority woman owned business be successful um, because of this, those structural impediments. Uh, so it's both belief and a little bit of transformation. Uh, Working Lands is a program that uh, has been around for about eight years now, and every year we've, we've been fighting for little scraps to, to fund it well, but it is one of the few places where we have, as a, as a state, created a program to give direct grants to, to businesses. Usually businesses get loan programs from the state. Um, we're doing a lot of granting now in the emergency context, but Working Lands is one where we've been actually making investments in various capacity uh, building uh, or business transformation projects in the farm and, and wood products sector. Uh, very well structured program, really ready to go on delivering a whole bunch of money out into that sector to help within the COVID relief context. So they're able to do it fast, they're able to link it to COVID, and at the same time it's transformative investments. Um, the, the majority of the economic development uh, commerce committee uh, resources that we had to work with are going to various forms of recovery grants uh, to businesses from two different uh, tranches of uh, and two, sort of two major programs um, that I, we've talked about before, uh, you know, in our meetings. But but fundamentally, that that should launch very very soon. It's going to go through the tax department, and it's designed to get the money out there very quickly um, to restaurants, hospitality, to retail, to places that are um, needing. A, a boost in their cash flow to try to weather this uh, this time period of, of depressed sales. Um, and I'll highlight one other piece and then um, throw it back to Emily and see what she wants to highlight. And then there are, there are so many details, it's not probably possible for us to list every single thing, um, but there may be questions that you have about specific types of investments that we've made. Um, but another one I wanted to highlight is that um, we were able to get five million uh, earmarked for the arts and cultural organization sector. Um, and uh, I think that's that's gonna be very important for Brattleboro given the role that the arts and cultural uh, economy plays you know, for us. And, um, and we were very resistant, largely resistant in the legislature to doing sector by sector work, um, but we were able to convince uh, the convention relevant committees uh, that there were some unique challenges to this particular sector and, and um, got five million set aside as a special program to be administered through the Vermont, Vermont Arts Council. Uh, who knows the sector better rather than having that sector fighting within the same bucket of money uh, with, with all the other businesses when they don't really fit in the same way. So, so that's an important um, piece that was added. And I will turn it over to Emily and then see what you want to highlight. I just want to say, I just want to add for a second that Tristan was really important in getting that money for the arts. And um, it's also not only challenges in that sector, but uh, contribute quite a bit to the economy. So thank you, Tristan. Yeah, I, I was able to make a strategic intervention. Thank you. Um, in, a, in that sort of, um, commerce financial assistance category, just wanna, um, the two tranches are, the first one is folks who experienced a 75% loss, and the next is folks who experienced a 50% loss. And so um, relief is really geared to the scale of the problem rather than um, any of the other 800 options for how relief could be scaled. Um, that's an emphasis awesome. on geographic parity, which I also think is important for people to remember. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. Just that 75% relative to previous year sales or 50%. So it, the, the benchmark is year to year so that you can show that during the peak COVID shutdown, your sales dropped by 75% or more year in the first tranche. Sorry. And then the other sector that we focused on specifically um, and sort of called out um, is outdoor recreation. Um, have a specific set aside and then um, there's a, in addition to the working lands funds, there's forest economy funds and ag producer funds. 
Um, and so I think that will be helpful for some folks in the Brattleboro area as well. Um, something else I it was really important to me, and at certain points when the um, conversation was looking particularly dark around some of these things, this was the point of light that I kept focused on, is the amount of money that we're putting towards housing in this. We've said before in these meetings, and I think it's really important that we, for the first time in perhaps Vermont history, um, we, everyone who needed housing in Vermont had housing. They had a door and a bed. Um, and I think that was really a powerful part of this, of the challenges of COVID and that we sort of learned the lesson that this was possible. And so put significant money towards maintaining that. And so there's $23 million that's going to the Vermont Housing Conservation Board grants. And a large amount of that um, can go to communities like Brattleboro to purchase transitional housing, something like a motel, um, as well as there's another um, about $25 million that's going to go to keep people housed. So that's eviction protection for both renters and homeowners, um, relief around both, you know, foreclosure and eviction, um, as well as a significant sum of money to help landlords rehab units and put them online. And so that's a total of around $85 million that's going towards housing. And it really is a split between folks who don't have stable housing now and need it and folks who um, are, were not at risk before COVID and are now at risk for their housing because of a decreased income. Um, so that's a really like super bright spot for me. Another bright spot is around um, broadband access. And so we know that, um, we already knew that we had a huge technology connectivity problem in the state. I think, um, you know, even in Brattleboro, people are, you know, who come from say Chittenden County are kind of shocked at how challenging our um, access is sometimes because we're considered, you know, a place that should have that. Um, and yet we know that, you know, from schools and health, it's become even more important that everyone has access. And so, um, and we also know, remember this money had to get spent by December 30th. And so what can you do in that time? And so the focus was really on, um, folks who had sort of a last, individuals with a last mile need. So um, to pay for that last stretch for folks who had school needs or health needs around telehealth. Um, so that's gonna get a whole bunch of people internet. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but it was really impressive how many folks who were gonna get access there. And then a big amount of money for rate, um, rate payer arrearages. And so that means that folks who have built up back bills around electricity or um, phone or internet um, who were prevented from having their services shut off during the state of emergency are going to be able to apply for funds to pay that bill now. And so that one, that means that folks won't have their services shut off, which is incredible. But it also means that the costs around that are not going to be um, pushed off to rate payers next year. So if a, um, if a regulated corporation suffers significant losses, that money then gets you know, transferred over the next year to increase rates for everyone. So it's both in those individuals' interests who are struggling as well as the interests of all Vermonters who want to keep their rates low. And so that was a, that's a really important investment. Um, Lot of money for healthcare, um, healthcare stabilization, both sort of individual smaller um, care practices, including naturopaths, um, primary care docs, um, adult day programs, as well as hospital systems. We know that all of those folks really had challenging financial times through COVID, um, as well as some really interesting work around health disparities um, that was put into this funding. And then Molly touched on food insecurity. There's a lot of money going to the food bank as well as to school food programs and summer food programs. And um, that will also include stuff for Meals on Wheels and a really fun program that was piloted down here in Brattleboro between um, SEVCA and the Downtown Business Alliance to use the infrastructure of restaurants and um, actually the refrigeration space and capacity of Mama Says to 
have cooked meals um, for a lot more Vermonters. And so that's gonna be rolled out throughout the state, but it really started here. So that's really exciting. Um, and then as a sort of final bucket of money that I was excited about, I really just get excited about moving money into communities, I think is really, really, a, um, is childcare funding. And so that is stabilization funding for childcare centers, children, children's integrated services, parent child centers, um, who really need funding to adapt their learning model and bring people back to work. There is other cool stuff in here, but that's where I'm going to stop. Um, a lot of the funding for individuals around rent stabilization and rate payer rearages and all of that stuff um, will be accessible through the community action agencies, even if they're not the ones um, specifically um, doing that. They're the folks in our community that already tend to have funding for that. And so they have systems in place to help you access that. Um, and so that's SEVCA here. And then for folks who want to figure out how to access business supports, um, whether that is the, you know, um, the outdoor recreation or the arts or the straight tax um, department grants, I would recommend talking to BDCC and they can help you navigate that. All of the regional development corporations um, received a significant um, quantity of funds in order to provide technical assistance around um, both shifting business models and accessing other financial supports. And I just want to add, I think the Vermont Commission on Women is is handling the um, the grants for women-owned businesses. I think that's correct, right? Yeah, in collaborate the yeah. Commission on Women in collaboration and, with the Vermont with, Community Loan Fund. Right, uh, and I, it was something else. Oh, yeah. Um, there's also 13 million for COVID related expenses for local government, which I think is really important. Um, things that the local governments had to do to, to address it. And that includes some regional planning money and money for solid waste districts. So, Questions? Um. The purchase of housing, yes, Michael, does need to happen by the end of the year. And we have a coalition in our area um, that started maybe about eight months ago um, in order to apply for a specific grant from the um, Boston Fed, actually. Um, that has been really focused on this conversation around purchasing something for transitional housing while we are engaged in really building out permanent housing, which takes a number of years. And so we are, I think, one of the two counties that's particularly very poised and ready to spend this money in a way that some other counties might not be able to. And so the folks at the table for that conversation are sort of who you would expect. It's Wind and Windsor Housing Trust and Groundworks and Brattleboro Savings and Loan and BDCC and... Um. I have a question um, about childcare. Um, because I live down the street from, I'm on Burge Street, so I've got childcare down the street and they walk by the house. Um, and because of the work I do, I'm very aware that there are a lot of people uh, I'm going to, just because of what I've been listening to, because of the news that's going on and stuff, I, I sense a very strong, um, I'm going to use the word class discrepancy between child, between funding for childcare. And I, I know people across the board right now need childcare support. They need a way to provide childcare for their children while parents in all, in all economic ranges uh, work full time. I've, I've got a son with two children, a family down in Massachusetts going through this. 
and it's desperate. Um, it strikes me that this is a chance, and I, I confess I lived in France for 10 years in, and in Paris for part of that time. The childcare provided there is across the board, the, 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 the setups, the, the childcare uh, institutions, uh, small storefront, you know, but con re reconfigured for childcare, everyone sends their children. It does not matter what your economic situation is. Um, is, is this child care funding addressing what, who, so, where is it yeah. getting? Um, first, I think it's really important to use the word class. Um, I, I don't think that we should, um, well, it's just, it's just I appreciate yeah. that you named it because I think if we can't say class, if we can't say class and race, then we can't talk about class and race and we need to talk about those things in a exactly. profound way in this state and particularly in this community. Okay. Um, this, this COVID relief funding doesn't do anything at all for any of that. Um, it really is just helping um, childcare folks, um, early care and education folks adapt to COVID, um, you know, like face masks and hygiene and stuff. However, we did pass significant legislation, this biennium, to make a difference around childcare, and we have a lot more to do. And so um, I can take you through a little bit of that, but it's a multi-hour conversation if we want to go really deep. So there, I'm maybe <laughs> the um, on Bird Street EES is a Head Start, and so they um, have particular federal funding to provide care to low-income families. That's they have a waiting list, and you're prioritized the lower income you are, and the more um, other barriers you have. And so that is not an integrated childcare environment. However, um, most of the childcare centers, early care and education centers in our area are integrated because we have um, a system of childcare financial assistance that um, provides um, stipends for childcare to various folks. And the work that we've done this biennium is to increase um, that reimbursement to childcare centers significantly, as well as sort of even out, um, it's actually, it's called a benefit, it's technically a benefits trough, but it's sort of a benefits cliff around childcare. And so what that means is that it's a much smoother road for folks as their income increases to continue to receive um, some reimbursement um, towards their childcare expenses. And so that's, that helps. And we're going to continue working on that. What's still a real challenge is that the folks who work at childcare, work providing early care and education, make minimum wage, which is not enough to live on. It's an incredibly difficult, stressful job. And then the folks are living in difficult, stressful poverty situations for doing that job. Um, and so, and the incentive to receive the incredibly important level of education they need to be in those jobs um, is not there because the pay is so low and you can't pay off your student loans and all those things. So it's a quite, it's sort of a three-legged stool. We are actually working on all three legs. Um, and I think within the next five years, we'll get somewhere towards solving it. But this pandemic really stretched an incredibly fragile system already. Um, Cause we can't afford to lose even one more childcare slot. Cause so we have a shortage it's too expensive and the people working there aren't making enough. And we are, we are sort of chipping away on all of those problems. Um, and we can have a much longer conversation about that sometime soon. I'd be happy to. It's oh, a I, just want, I just want to add one thing to that is that in Quebec, they have subsidized childcare, well, like France, and for everybody. And I mean, the impact on the economy, and we've done studies, is really great. And not only would it benefit our economy if we had like universal subsidized childcare, but it also would attract young families to live in Vermont. I mean, it just seems like, you know, we would need, we need to invest a lot in that. And we just have a mentality in this country about, you know, well, I mean, maybe we can get employers to pay for it. I mean, I think it ought to be come out of general tax revenue, but that's another story. Yeah. I, I, I have one other question, and Molly, that was just, that's so great. Um, which has to do with what um, I observe and have read about 
which is the uh, the sort of the the un, un unnamed, unaddressed, untalked about problem with children, but with families, two income families with children stuck at home. The the uh, in incredible in psychological impact that this is having, that it is tearing families apart. It is putting a huge mental health, putting us into a major mental health crisis that, that nobody, there isn't time, sort of time. Uh, it, it, it's hard to pull that up to priority level and yet it's sitting there and it can, is there a way to support that uh, to use any of this money, or is it being supported in any way in our communities in Vermont, where I'm sure it's just uh, rampant? Uh, it, oh, perhaps less so because we are not, because we are rural and people can get outside. People, children can play outside in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Families can separate. There's more space than in cities, but it is a... Chloe a, Leary, who... Um, is the director of Winston Prouty um, and is on the statewide Building Bright Futures Council and um, the head of the local Building Bright Futures Council, I think yeah. really um, eloquent and articulate about this issue. And that as we struggle with reopening, um, we talk about reopening for the sake of the economy, but the other reason that we want to reopen early care and education and schools is so that um, Families who are struggling mightily, and often, you know, mothers more than fathers um, are struggling with the balance of work and school and child and home. Um, and children who are struggling mightily, often not getting their needs met without schools. Um, really, we need, that's one of the reasons that we're reopening is so that, you know, folks can be reconnected with each other and accessing those outside resources. It's really, um, the movement towards community schools and towards um, early care and education that's really deeply integrated with families is really powerful and important, um, but it, it covers up other challenges in our lives um, that have really been exacerbated through this time, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Mary has a question. Okay. About Something I wanted to interject at some point, but I'm happy to take a couple more questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. This is, uh, this is your time. <laughs> well, it's interesting, Mary, apropos of your question in the chat box, that it's interesting that the governor just said that he's open to deficit spending for education. So the question was, what is the discussion about the educational funding issues related to reduce taxes or seats and the need for potential increased supports? Sorry, just not since the listening audience from BCTV won't be able to see the chat. Shall I start that one? Okay, um, so this is a conversation that's been pretty much the primary conversation we've had in Ways and Means over the last three months. I still have no idea um, how many, what weeks are. Um, and so there is significant money right now um, that's separate from this tranche of COVID relief funds that's specific for schools from the federal government. And that will go to meet some of those increased needs. Um, and this year, we, through the yield bill, which passed, we have made a commitment to not raise property taxes um, beyond what they sort of would slightly go up in a normal year. Um, and to make sure that we are that the hole that's sort of left in the ed fund because of other lost revenue mostly related to prop um to rooms and meals taxes and sales taxes that we will find a different way to fill that hole um not on the backs of schools mm -hmm. so in the yield bill there's a sort of a bunch of different possibilities for how we will fill that hole um one of them is we've set aside some of the covid relief funds in the hopes that we will be able to get more guidance or different guidance um, from the federal government that we are allowed to use it for that, or that more federal money will come, you know, raining down from the federal money sky. Um, and so we'll be able to fill it that way. That's absolutely our first best option. Um, and we're hopeful for that. And so that's one of the reasons that we're coming back in August rather than just um, 
wrapping up the biennium the way we normally would. Other options and sort of the next best option there would be borrowing um, or, you know, deficit spending or however you want to phrase that. And there are a lot of very good options for that available right now. There's um, municipal liquidity funds and a bunch, you know, um, a greater range than usual and rates are very good. Our um, treasurer, Beth Pierce, really, 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 really doesn't like borrowing money. It's just like not her thing. She's never even had a mortgage actually fa fascinatingly. Um, and so, but that's sort of the next thing on the list and it goes from there. There's other ways we can raise revenue. Um, you know, cannabis is still in conference committee. Maybe that will pass soon and that will make a difference. Um, that's one, you know, that's actually a very small amount of money. People get very excited about it, but it's really not very much money. Um, and, you know, there's other options too. There's, you know, Trump tax cuts. There is um, a quite um, famous, um, piece of tax legislation a number of years ago um, called the Snelling Surcharge, which was a um, Republican instituted um, surcharge on very, the highest income bracket um, that was temporary through the recession. And so there's conversations about that, but i um, really proud of how um, on the very same page, most legislators and the entire Ways and Means Committee seems to be on the fact that this can't happen on the backs of children and families um, and that the schools absolutely must be fully funded be given how incredibly high the needs are right now and how important it is to keep our communities stable and whole. If this uh, I don't know if you vote should if you have not voted yet for the school budget Wyndham Southeast School District budget vote happening right now. You can go to the town clerk's office and get a ballot. You can call the town clerk's office to get a ballot at your house and mail it in. Vote now. I think it's like next week it's over. So vote, please. Thank you for that. You actually don't have time to mail. Go to the town clerk's office. Molly, do you know what day it ends? Well, the 30th, I think. The vote Which is on the 30th. Tuesday. Yeah. Um, is this a good moment? Is there any ha hand waiting that I missed? Is this a good moment to add my extra layer here? I think it is. Or Michael, you have your hand up? Uh, yeah. it, it, it just came up, but uh, on the question of the arts funding, um, are there any, um, is it completely up to the Arts Council? I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, if you make art, uh, during this um, this period of time, and if you're smart about it, you've been able to make some money still by selling online or whatever. If you are a performing arts organization, your your uh, revenues basically went to z zilch. Uh, so, is there anything sort of specifically targeted for the performing arts or, or not? So the um, the five million is designed to be for. Um, for cultural organizations as well. Um, so there's sort of two different program ideas within the uh, Vermont Arts Council, some of which goes to, I think, 40 or 42 local arts organizations to be sort of, to be re-granted out, um, and then some of it to the larger cultural organizations. And the, the goal, similar to uh, the way that we've designed the economic relief dollars for the general Nonprofit and profit for profit business sector is to um, to try to get it to the people who are most impacted in their revenues um, and so and, and or most likely to struggle to stay alive long enough to get a return to business so cultural venues are um, need to be seen differently and um, because in many cases uh, you know, music venues or galleries uh, that you know, like museums those kinds of places are going to struggle to get anything like the kind of numbers that would normally be the, the, the flow of their business so we expect them to be among the last to be able to fully reopen and so we're trying to make sure that the mechanism for getting the money is able to see them and understand them in a, in a more nuanced way um, and hope it's enough money and probably i mean that this is something that we haven't said it's uh, this week, I don't think, but um, this is a tremendous amount of money flowing out into the Vermont economy in different ways, and it's nowhere near enough. 
and um, we're going to have business losses, nonprofit losses. Um, this is going to happen, and it's not because we as legislators, you know, don't want everybody to make it through this crisis, but uh, we don't have the taxing capacity in state to solve this de the the gap in revenues on our own. And while the 1.25 uh, in the early money from the federal administration was hugely important, um, it could easily be three times this, and and we could put it all out into economic recovery grants, and probably be okay. And in the big picture, that's not actually that much money for the federal government, but but we're dependent on the federal government getting to the realization that they need to push more money of this type out into the system. Uh, and right now, the politics of that are untenable in the Senate, in the federal Senate. Thank you. Um, Tristan, can I uh, add a question to that topic? Yeah. Okay. Um, I also understand, I understood yesterday that uh, the Better Places initiative did not get included in that package, and I was just kind of curious about that. Uh, that was a Senate problem. The House uh, voted one million for the Better Places, and I honestly don't know what their rationale was, why they, why they refused to fund that. But they they took the money away, uh, and you know you could say they put it into other buckets. They spent more on certain buckets than we did, but they they funded that at zero dollars. Hmm. Okay, so and I don't know why. Right. I do want to say that the House put in a hundred thousand dollars to the. Downtown Transportation Fund, which has been funded at about four hundred thousand dollars, so it's like an extra hundred thousand, which is for specifically to enhance um, other projects downtown and, and make make downtown a more um, accessible and friendly place to be. So this was the Better Places grant was a million dollars that would have been used to help make um, make municipalities give access to you know to dollars to help municipalities. Uh, make themselves more friendly for you know the COVID era, you know that kind of thing. Michael asked the question of what it what it was. Um, it is possible that they think that the municipal grant program may address some of that. It's possible that they think that other programs may address it. I don't believe that they thought it wasn't a necessary, you know, an important thing to have happen. Um, but I think they may have assumed that there are other mechanisms for those monies to reach the municipalities to address those same issues. And it was a proposal that was on the table before COVID um, and being pushed fairly hard by the Agency of Commerce before COVID. And so in a conversation about COVID relief, it looks like a proactive rather than a reactive program, which is one of the reasons I really like it. Um, but it also makes sense then sort of um, when you're drowning in a pile of needs, proactive action often feels very difficult and um, restrictive. And so, but um, it happened fairly at the last minute with the Senate. And so maybe we'll find out by next week what people were thinking. With yeah. that. It's hard to, um, when we're operating virtually, it's um, the distance between the bodies is um, even more distinct between the House and the Senate in those conversations. Um, I wanna make sure that um, we have a moment to say that we passed um, really a very, very first baby step in um, racial justice legislation yesterday, um, a use of force bill. And we are going to have a much longer conversation around um, sort of a second part of that racial justice conversation that we had two weeks ago um, on July 9th. And we're gonna have that in the evening rather than on a Saturday morning. And so we're gonna be taking a break from these weekly Saturday conversations for a little bit um, so that we can all rest and rework our brains to um, think slightly differently again and um, looking forward to having that evening conversation on racial justice and maybe some more different people can attend. Um, so that's going to be on July 9th, um, probably at 7 p.m. And so we'll send out information about that closer to the date um, once we invite some folks to join us. And so we'll talk about the legislation that we just passed as well as the legislation that we're working on for August. So I'm, I'm and I think you had some things you wanted to add. Yeah, I, did, I just wanted to bring up one more area and it does relate to COVID. Um, and that is the workers comp changes that we made yesterday. Thank you. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Patsy, this, 
uh, you reminded me of this because you raised the question of, of class inequities. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, we did something right on the edge of that yesterday. And it, it may seem like it's unrelated uh, if you don't start to think about it a little bit more, but um, I'm not saying you wouldn't see the connection, Patsy, but you know, the, the idea here being that <laughs> workers comp decisions about what is covered and what is not covered is um, very much uh, a part, it's, it's right at the edge of the, the long-standing tension between management slash ownership and workers about the nature of work. Um, and uh, you know, the, the fact is, is that uh, in ordinary circumstances, if you um, are at work and you, are in contact with COVID and you get it, there's no existing mechanism uh, for you to make a workers' comp claim for that. Oh. And that is because um, we have never covered, like we don't cover the flu, for instance, we don't cover those, you know, and, and that, so that decision of whether it's in or out is a legislative decision. Um, and we made a decision that it's in uh, and we put some bumpers around it. Um, we, dis we differentiated between people who are frontline workers who have been sort of within the sort of essential worker umbrella uh, in their response to COVID where they are very likely to come in directly into contact with people who have COVID or um, you know, working in environments where that risk is substantially elevated. And then everybody else um, and we, um, and what we, so the first thing to do was basically bringing COVID temporarily, it's only a temporary fix, but temporarily inside of the workers' comp framework um, and then providing a mechanism for proof. But then when you get into workers' comp, there's another dimension of the sort of the struggle of power, which is um, who, on whom does the burden fall to prove uh, that this was, that they got it at work. And um, what we have, is for frontline workers, we have a presumption that um, the burden of proof falls on the business to, to show that it didn't happen at work. Uh, and for everybody else, the burden frankly falls more on the employee to prove that there was a reason why they think that they got it at work and that the, the, you know, the, uh, the evidence strongly you know, leads to that conclusion, like the preponderance of evidence is on their side, that sort of thing. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a two different standards, all all about where that risk falls. But from my perspective, and I think for all three of us, you know, the the idea that we could be asking people to return to work, frankly, starting to shift away from the protection if they choose not to go back to work on the unemployment side, um, as we get out, you know, sort of into the next phase of work, um, asking people to put themselves at increased risk without actually acknowledging that the workplace could be a site of in increased risk, and therefore it is fundamentally a workers' comp related issue, uh, was untenable uh, to me and to us. And, um, and we, did, we did get something that is a substantial improvement over the status quo. Uh, and I'll let either Emily or Molly jump in if you like. The, I, um, the burden of proof in sort of that second category for um, non frontline workers um, is, I think, a really um, helpful detail for everyone, actually, because the burden of proof lies in whether or not a workplace followed best practices according to the Agency of Commerce's sort of restart business guidance. And so it really places a further incentive on employers to take the time to read through that guidance and make sure it's in place. Because if that guy, if that those practices are not in place, then the burden of proof falls back on the employer. The second piece that's really important to me about this is that this doesn't just protect workers; it also protects employers' financial and legal liability. Because when we move things out of um, out of the relationship directly between the employer and the employee and into the land of workers' comp, it becomes an insurance issue, and we have insurance to protect us from high risk situations. And so. If there is a claim, the cost sits with the insurance company. It does not sit with the employer anymore, which is a big difference. Because right now, if we hadn't acted, the cost would have sat with the employer if there was a legal challenge. And so 
when it sits with the insurance companies, um, they are prepared and have built out all of their models to account for risk and cost. This piece, a second piece of the legislation that I think is important about that is that often um, when we have an area where there are a lot of claims or an employer, there are a lot of claims, then that employer's experience rating goes up and so the cost of their insurance goes up. But in this case, we have said, similar to what we did with COVID and unemployment, um, your experience rating is not affected by anything related to COVID. And so while this might be an increased cost to insurance companies, in the short and medium term, it will not be an increased cost um, for employers. And we have, um, there is testimony from the National Workers' Comp Insurance um, association so that's an industry association not a um advocacy organization who um are on board with these changes and so that i think is really important to remember that we are not just shifting the burden onto employers we're shifting the burden onto insurance companies who are best to prepare prepared to deal with this kind of risk and this provoked a lot of discussion yesterday there was a long long debate and amendments around taking this out uh, for the non-hazard uh, occupations and uh, interestingly enough there were only about I think 30 votes in in favor of, of taking this out uh, for the for the non um, non frontline workers so I, it, it did have broad support even among uh, Republicans so I'm gonna take some credit Trist I think Tristan and I both deserve some credit as like doing some serious hustle to get it down to just those 30 votes um. <laughs> Probably, yes, invisible to other people, but we both have been working the phones and working um, some of the members who are freaking out. Um, Emily served for most of her first term in uh, the House Commerce Committee and knows this issue inside and out. And, and thank you, Molly, for uh, highlighting the fact that it was both strong votes uh, in the end and, um, and that it uh, attracted a lot of attention uh, on the floor. Um, and uh, Molly spoke in, in was, favor of it as a, as a business owner, you know, as well, um, which was really, you know, an important contribution in the floor debate. Well, so I realized that we were hearing all sorts of, you know, why reasons why we weren't hearing from a lot of employers. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And, and just two quick ads, the standards that they're expected to apply, um, uh, in order, the employers are in order to, to get a presumption. Um, in their favor include municipal standards. So uh, for Brattleboro area businesses, if they're not following Brattleboro's guidance, um, for instance, if they're letting people come in and out of a store without masks, um, and when there's a guidance that that's required, um, they would not get the same presumption uh, because they would have been tolerating an unsafe work environment. So, so the, you know, there's an incentive here too for municipalities to to be leaders in, in stronger standards. Um, and the, the modeling, the financial modeling for this is that at a 5% infection rate, um, and I'll explain the context of that, at a 5% infection rate, it might cost 4 million distributed throughout the entire workers' comp system. Um, our current infection rate is 0.18. So the difference, we've had about 1,200 people test positive the 5% infection rate would be about 30,000. So 25 times what have we experienced so far, the estimate is an increase of 4 million across the whole system, not, not you know, in any one sector. Uh, so it was clearly, and it, it does cost more, it will be because employees got COVID at work and they should be covered for that because they got it because they were at work. And I think that that's the fundamental value statement of what we did, which is to acknowledge that if you are if you're experiencing that risk and have that harm through your work, you deserve to be supported in a different way. And that, and so that's why we brought that in. Uh, I have to sign off. I know that the, you, you all may finish. I have to leave in just a few minutes for a funeral. So I'm going to leave. But Emily, I believe you're co-host and you'll be able to keep the meeting going to Great. say goodbye. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Hope we can see you on July 9th. And uh, Emily and Molly, I hope you rest well. Um, so to wrap up, um, Bob, do you have a final question or are you waving? Okay. Um, 
I still don't know if you have a final question or you're waving. <laughs> Me? No, Bob, he's doing something with his hands, but I think, I think he's good. Maybe he's gonna type me a secret message. He's just waving, great. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, I think we are all available for further questions via email or phone call or it's harder to stop us in the street these days. Hello, Kevin. Um, and really looking forward to having more conversations in the future and hope everyone can join us on July 9th to talk about racial justice and criminal justice and the intersection between those two issues. Thanks for a great um, session, everyone. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks Molly, thanks Emily, thanks Tristan. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.